Right, our first important um, additional structure in the membrane uh, or component of the membrane is a related member of the lipid family, cholesterol. Okay, now cholesterol, as you can see, has got a very different structure um, to phospholipids. It's got this four carbon ring structure. In many, it's kind of like a flat planar molecule. And because of that, it kind of disrupts the flow of the lipids, uh, of the phospholipids in the two dimensions. So wherever there's cholesterol, um, the movement of the lipids gets a bit um, obstructed. And because of that, um, cholesterol is said to reduce the membrane fluidity. So that's how it affects the membrane. And effectively, what that helps to do is helps to regulate the permeability of the membrane, permeability of the membrane. Because when the phospholipids are moving around really quickly, it allows things to pass through more quickly, things that maybe um, we want to keep outside or we want to keep inside. So by reducing the fluidity of the membrane, A, you reduce its permeability, and B, it provides uh, more stability. It makes the membrane more stable, less likely to break. Okay, but let's just stick to these words. It makes the membrane more stable. Okay, so what it does is reduce the membrane fluidity. Effectively, what it helps the membrane to do is, is, is regulate its permeability, makes it less permeable to, to things that are, might otherwise just move through the membrane, and secondly, makes the membrane more stable structure. Okay? Okay, so we've discussed cholesterol. Now our next two very um, important components are transport proteins. There are two types that you need to be aware of. The first is called the channel protein and essentially what that does is allows things to move down their concentration gradient down their concentration gradient um, things that otherwise might not be able to move through the hydrophobic um, part of the membrane so we're here we're talking about things like ions um, uh, mineral ions, um, bigger ions such as nitrates, and you know, slightly bigger and more polar and hydrophilic molecules such as glucose and other sugars. Okay, so things that might not, things that are hydrophilic, hydrophilic, and cannot move directly through the membrane. These channel proteins allow them to move down their concentration gradient, and we call this facilitated diffusion. Okay, and um, you. So here I'm just showing that you know S meaning you know any kind of solute will be able to move through the channel protein because the channel protein kind of provides a hydrophilic region that the solute might find it more easy to move through compared to the very hydrophobic um, inner part of the membrane. So the channel protein allows uh, molecules, hydrophilic molecules, to move down their concentration gradient in facilitated diffusion. And one example, and you know, I'm, I would really urge you to kind of make links to other parts of the course where these things might be applied. One example where we looked at this was in the co-transporter. So I'll just put here, e.g. the co-transporter that co-transported H plus and sucrose in the companion cell in, uh, in sucrose translocation. Okay, so for example, the co-transporter H plus and sucrose um, I'll just put brackets, companion, cell. Okay, so remember that? So it's that kind of uh, protein that is doing that job. 
the other kind of transport protein is the carrier protein. Carrier protein. Now what these do, as shown here in the diagram, uh, have they found me? Right. As shown in this diagram, ATP is broken down to ADP and uh, phosphate to release energy, and this energy is used to transport things. And often, you need energy to transport things in this way because you are moving them against their concentration gradient. So I'll just make a note, energy, ATP, required because you're moving uh, things against the concentration gradient. Okay, so whenever things are actively being um, moved, I'll just make a note there, active, active transport, whenever things are being moved um, from outside to inside or inside to outside against the concentration gradient, you'll need energy to do that, and these proteins allow that to occur. They can use the energy from the breakdown of ATP to undergo conformation changes that move things against concentration gradient. Okay, so those are carrier proteins. Um, you might even see them referred to as pumps. Now, some examples where we've looked at this, or some, some examples that we've already come across in other parts of the course include, I'll just refer to my notes here, um, yeah, in the root. So, where's the best place to put this stuff? I'll just put them here. Examples include, in the root hair, the movement of mineral ions. Remember when, uh, if you've already seen that section, when the ions are actively moved from outside the root hair cell into the root hair cell with the use of ATP, that was active transport. It would have required a protein like this. Um, other examples include the H plus pump in the companion cell. Companion cell of phloem in translocation of sucrose. Um, and also, um, other examples also include the transport, the movement of nitrates, active transport of nitrates into xylem when we were talking about movement of water uh, from the root into the xylem, okay? So from the root hair cell into the xylem. Okay, so these are all examples of active transport. Um, you might come across others in the course, make a note, it requires a protein like this, okay? Right, that then is transport proteins, okay? Okay, uh, we talked about cholesterol in the regulation of membrane fluidity. So we discussed cholesterol's role in membrane fluidity. We've now discussed transport proteins in membranes and what job they do. Remember, um, you know, things, cells need things from the outside, um, such as glucose, such as nitrates, amino acids, and those things can't easily move through the membrane, so you need these proteins to make that happen. Okay, guys? So, let's move on. All right, guys, let's move on. This diagram is going to get a little bit busy, but hopefully, um, as we are moving through gradually, um, you know, you should be able to make sense of it, okay? Now, our fourth important component is receptor proteins. Okay, so I guess now we're moving on to the third category of um, membrane components, which is those involved in communication and the communication between cells um, and cell-cell recognition. Okay, so one way that cells can kind of sense what's going on on the outside and receive messages produced by other cells is via a protein that is shaped uh, like this which has a complementary shape to a hormone or other um, signaling molecules such as cytokines, growth factors. So 
So this particular protein has a complementary shape to this hormone, which might be circulating around in the blood, diffuses out, um, comes in contact with a cell. This particular protein has got a complementary shape to that hormone or cytokine. And therefore, when that binding occurs, the engagement of the hormone with the receptor induces a signaling process inside the cell. A signaling process. And these can often be very complicated networks of interactions between proteins in the cell. And But what I'm going to do is summarize that by saying that all kind of cell surface mediated receptors transmit information from outside the cell by binding something outside the cell and then by starting a signaling process in the cell which ultimately results in the cell making some kind of behavioral change and is making a response. Okay, so for example, if this is insulin, if that's insulin binding um, the insulin receptor and that interaction is very specific, insulin won't bind to um, growth factor receptor, it won't bind any other receptors, it will only bind the receptor which has a complementary shape. So this is important. So here we're talking about protein, actually we are talking about receptor, receptor proteins, okay? And these have a, these are complementary to a particular hormone or cytokine. And when the cytokine is engaged, when the hormone is engaged by the out, you know, by the binding site, inside the cell it starts off a signaling process. And the cell makes a response to that. So if this if we're, we're looking at a liver cell here, for example, when insulin binds um, the insulin receptor on the liver cell, it starts the response that makes the cell ultimately absorb more glucose from the outside, thereby lowering the blood glucose levels. Okay? And for example, we could be talking about something completely different here. The, the hormone or the cytokine in, um, in question could be a cytokine that was released by a T cell. And when it binds the appropriate receptor on the uh, B cell, it will start a signaling uh, process that will make the B cell then kind of proliferate. You know, during, during the immune response now we're talking about, um, it would be this kind of interaction, this kind of communication between cytokine released by one cell binding to another cell, and the cell then responding by increasing its pr proliferation, maybe um, helping it the process of differentiation to produce the plasma cells, differentiation to produce plasma cells and memory B cells and so on. Okay, so this is what receptor proteins allow. They allow the communication, the response of a cell to particular growth factors, cytokines or hormones. Okay, and that will depend on which receptor is there, which hormone is there, the responses can be different. But it's these receptor proteins that allow this communication to happen. Okay, so in general terms, receptor proteins allow that cell to make a response to a hormone, to a cytokine. Okay, okay so getting to the end now, um, but in our family of proteins that are involved in signaling and communication between cells. Okay, in our uh, family of, of those things, we have glycoproteins and glycolipids. All right, now this simply means that there's a protein made of amino acids, polypeptide chains, tertiary structure, and so on, but a 